please, please. Because when you die, I don't want Jesus to say to you, depart from me, I do not know you. I want him to say, welcome home, good and faithful servant. What's up, YouTube? Ryan here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where on every episode, I am always contending for the faith, once for all, delivered to the saints. And on this episode, I can't believe the words are going to come out of my mouth. I'm defending evangelicals. Roll the credits, I'm going to be sick. So if you're new to my channel, you might not know that oftentimes I'm actually very critical of the teachings and doctrines of mainline American evangelicalism. I'm not an evangelical, I am a confessional Lutheran. Ergo, I'm critical of their heterodox and, in some cases, heretical teachings. And I'm not alone in this feeling towards evangelicals. We're going to examine the words of Pastor Brandon Robertson, who is very critical of evangelicals. So if you are indeed new to the channel, definitely stick around. Hit that subscribe button, ring the notification bell, and scroll through all the other stuff. It's not always criticism like this. There's a lot of positive confessions about what Christians have always believed, taught, and confessed. There's some chanting. There's some uh, home meditation and liturgies. There's all sorts of stuff on the channel. So subscribe and check it out. Now, a few weeks ago, I'm assuming maybe you all know, there was a, a rather woke pastor who, who went on public record as saying, Jesus is a racist. And recently he has come back to address those who have criticized him. Now, rather than address their arguments, he has chosen a path that borders on ad hominem. Uh, he is not attacking the argument. He is coming dangerously close to ad hominem, which means uh, to the man or against the man. He is attacking the people themselves because they, in piety to Christ, do not agree with what he says. Now, why do I say in piety to Christ? I say that because Jesus says, if you love me, keep my words. And as I always, ironically enough, say at the beginning of every episode that I am contending for the one singular faith. Now that is biblical. That comes right out of Jews. Jude, uh, sorry, contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. So there is only one true Christian faith. And that's going to be important in his rebuttal. And we're going to have to address that. But first things first, I don't want to put words in this man's mouth. So I'm going to pop on my headset here and we're going to listen to him uh, explain the gospel of Mark to us and show us how uh, Jesus is a racist. Did you know that there's a part of the Gospel of Mark where Jesus uses a racial slur? In Mark chapter 7, there's the account of the Seraphonician woman, a woman who is Syrian and Greek, both of which there were strong biases against within the Jewish community. And she comes to ask Jesus to heal her daughter who's possessed by a demon. And what is Jesus' response? He says, it's not good for me to give the children's food, meaning the children of Israel's food, to dogs. He calls her a dog. What's amazing about this account is that the woman doesn't back down. She speaks truth to power. She confronts Jesus and says, well, you can think that about me, but even dogs deserve the crumbs from the table. Her boldness and bravery to speak truth to power actually changes Jesus' mind. Jesus repents of his racism and extends healing to this woman's daughter. I love this story because it's a reminder that Jesus is human. He had prejudices and bias, and when confronted with it, he was willing to do his work. And this woman was willing to stand up and speak truth. Yeah, um, <clears throat> about that, um, Reverend, a couple of things. Um, certainly, uh, Jesus is human. Um, of, I, I'm a Bible-believing Christian. I have to confess the incarnation that um, the eternal uh, person of the Son stepped into uh, time from eternity and incorporated into his divinity, our humanity, that he, um, he is, is, is united, uh, God and man, in one Christ. He is human. But he had no prejudices. None. He is not a racist. And I would ask... Who are you to call your creator 
a racist. As we read in the, the beginning of the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. But John also says, <clears throat> all things are created by him. You see, God the Father spoke all things into existence, and Jesus is the Word of God. Ergo, John calls Jesus the Creator. God the Father spoke the Word Christ, the Holy Spirit hovering over the waters, the entirety of the Godhead included in the act of creation. Now, God created Adam and Eve, male and female. That's it. Created them in his image. And God wrote into their DNA the ability to adapt to your surroundings. That is why some people are white. That is why some people are black. That is why some people are Asian. That is why some people are Hispanic. God wrote that into our DNA. And this kind of diversity of skin color and outward appearance is what makes God such a great creator because he has created us to not all be carbon copies of each other. So no, God is not a racist. Jesus is not a racist. And another argument that I know has been made is the Greek knerion, the Greek word used there for dog, which refers more to a family pet than a wild or a street dog. So <clears throat> there is some affection uh, from Jesus. Now, <coughs> excuse me. Now, you did say that this, from Mark's account, we can know that this woman said to Jesus, you can think that about me. Hmm. Read from Matthew's account, which is a much clearer account, and you realize the woman said, you're right. You see, <clears throat> there's a progression of Jesus' ministry in that he came uh, to his own. John says that in the beginning, doesn't he? In the beginning of his gospel, he came to his own. And uh, he really didn't do much for the Gentiles. He was focused on what he was doing. Then there, we have the cross and the resurrection. And after, the, after the, the purpose of his life had been served, where he suffered and made satisfaction for our sin and rose again from the dead, victorious over sin, death, and the devil, now the progression has changed to first the Jew, then the Gentile, and then later on throughout the book of Acts and all of the epistles, everybody. So because he is so cross-focused on what he's doing, i.e. going to the cross, this is why he does this. And I will provide a link above to a sermon of Martin Luther that I presented a few weeks ago on the verses out of Matthew, where we come to find out, uh, reverend, <clears throat> it was always Jesus' intent to heal this woman's daughter. That was always his intent. He knew he was going to do that. And because he is God in human flesh, he also knew the level of her faith. But because he was sitting in front of the children, the, the children of Israel, because he was sitting in front of the elite, the ones he came for, he pressed this woman so as to draw that faith out of her in front of them so that they could see what faith towards him should look like. He did this to this woman. He spoke this way to this woman to show us her faith so that we could see it, so that we could see what faith in Christ looks like. And what faith in Christ looks like is not speaking truth to power, but confessing to God what he says about us, which is exactly what that woman did. She said, you are right. She didn't say, you can, say, you can think that about me. She said, you are right. So, we same speak to God. That's what confession is. To say back to God what he has said to us. This is why when we go to God in confession of sin, we say to him of our sin what his word says to us. We're same speaking back to God. So the woman didn't speak truth to power. She made a good confession. Now, um, <clears throat> evangelical pastors and, and other Christians like me have taken to all of their platforms uh, to criticize this and to do what I just did and to do it much better than I did and to do it in, in much greater depth than even I did. So go check some of those out. But he has now come back to address his critics. And that's actually the real focus of this video. So let's throw the headset back on and see what he has to say.
Hmm. Hold on. All right, it's re reloading. Here we go. Twenty levels, and I know several other Christians have done responses to this video, but there's some things that they haven't said that I would like to say, and that's what I'm going to give you today. After posting my video a few weeks ago where I explored the story in the Gospel of Mark where Jesus calls the Seraphonician woman a dog and refuses to heal her daughter, a lot of evangelical pastors have responded in different podcasts and radio shows and YouTube shows. And it reminded me as I've watched and engaged with all of these responses why I'm no longer an evangelical. You see, historically, Christianity has been able to be a big tent, holding thousands of different beliefs and perspectives together in one body of Christ. But among evangelicals, that can't exist. They draw lines in the sand and say, we alone have the right perspective and everyone else is wrong. And not only that, but we won't even dialogue with people that we disagree with. We're just going to tell you why they're wrong. We're going to rally against them. And that's it. There's nothing about that arrogance that mirrors Jesus. And this is the portion, dear YouTube viewer, where I jump to the defense of my evangelical brothers and sisters in Christ. Because this man is wrong. He is wrong. Every word out of his mouth is wrong. Not only is it wrong, it's a bold-faced lie. How do we know that? Well, first he says, um, well, first comes the ad hominem attack. It reminded me why I'm no longer an evangelical. Well, that's a very pha pharisaical thing of you to say. God, I thank you that I'm not like that poor sinner over there. I know, I know. I played the Pharisee card, but I played it in context. So, I win. <laughs> this is what it is. Um, then he says, <clears throat> Christianity is a big tent, and it can hold thousands of ideas. No. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Listen, listen, pastor. The faith, once for all, delivered to the saints. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. There is one true Christian faith. Or, <clears throat> as the book of Acts would put it, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, to doctrine. Jesus himself says, if you love me, keep my words. So it is love and piety to Christ, oft, albeit often misguided on the part of the evangelicals, but that's why they come at you the way that they do. They're defending what the Word of God actually says in context according to the rules of language and grammar. And they're doing this because <clears throat> in your wokeness, in your attempt to point out that Jesus is human and he had his prejudices, you've made him a sinner. You, he, he was human. He made a racist comment. He had his own prejudices that he needed to work towards. He was tempted in every way that we are tempted, yet without sin. This is what evangelicals are defending, you moron. This is what they are defending. They are defending the divinity combined with the humanity of Christ and his absolute perfection and obedience to the Father because, I'm speaking to you in your own woke language, they are defending it because if he is not perfect, if he is not sinless, if he is not pure, if he is not holy, then his sacrifice on the cross does jack shit for us. Does nothing. You lose. Good day, sir. If Jesus is a sinner, then we are lost. If Jesus was a sinner, then God would not have accepted the sacrifice on the cross and would not have raised him from the dead. You need to understand that these evangelicals are coming after you because you took away the resurrection. You took away the hope of eternal life. I don't see in you. The love of Christ. Ooh, I really wobbled that camera, didn't I? Look at that. I don't see in you the love of Christ. What you see is Christ-like behavior. Righteous indignation. Just as God himself called his own people whores who were chasing after monster cocks 
just as the prophet Elijah said to the, 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 the priest of Baal, pray louder, your God can't hear you, he's shitting. Just as Jesus said to the heretics of his day, you are whitewashed tombs, presenting yourself all pure and righteous on the outside, but inwardly you are full of, full of dead bones. You are a brood of vipers. Just as Paul said of the Judaizers, I'd rather you cut your cock off than insist that salvation is by circumcision and not grace alone. D Ugh. This is why evangelicals are mad at you. This is why. Because you have taken away salvation. You have stripped them of the hope of eternal life. And that's why they're pissed off. That's why they're mad. Now, as far as you being a pastor after, after these stunts that you've just pulled, you are unqualified. Because the pastoral epistles tell us that a pastor is not above reproach. You should be accepting this criticism and re-examining in light of the word of God what that one true Christian apostolic teaching has always been. Your idea of Christianity is... I can't even say it's brand new. It seems brand new because it came 2,000 years later, but it's simply ancient heresy repackaged. Do you know how I know that Christianity is not a tent that encompasses all sorts of different teachings? Because there were seven ecumenical councils fighting these things out. The first one recorded for us in the book of Acts at the Council of Nicaea. St. Nicholas, in defense of Christ's divinity, punched Arius in the face. This is how Christians are supposed to get when the word of God is perverted. Don't believe me because we're not emulating Christ. When the temple was not being used for its intended purpose, Jesus got royally, righteously pissed off, flipped tables, fashioned a whip, and beat people. This is what Christians are called to do. The word of God calls us to shine light onto darkness, to expose evil, and to call to repentance those who are false teachers. You want me to emulate Christ? I will use his own words. <clears throat> Woe to you, Pastor Brandon Robertson, for leading one of these little ones whom believes in Christ to sin. It would be better for you that a millstone be tied around your neck and you be drowned in the depths of the sea. Now, if you, <clears throat> and this is what I want you to do, if you repent for what you've done, if you repent of your religion of wokeness, and if you <clears throat> want to be part of that apostolic teaching, that apostolic doctrine, that one faith that once for all was delivered to the saints, if you want to be a part of that and you repent, then I have more of Jesus' words to you. Peace be with you. You see, you have betrayed Christ. You have betrayed him. You have denied him. You have called him a liar and a sinner. You have fashioned him after your own image and after your own likeness. You are an idolater. You have not feared, loved, and trusted in God above all things in the same way the disciples did when they betrayed him and when they denied him. But because of his suffering, death, and resurrection, when he greets them, he shows them his hands and his feet and says, Peace be with you. And I know as much as they screw it up, that's what these evangelical pastors want for you too. But I'm not an evangelical, I'm a Lutheran. And so I'm saying, I'm begging you, I'm pleading with you, repent and believe the gospel. <laughs> please, please. Because when you die, I don't want Jesus to say, to you, depart from me, I do not know you. I want him to say, welcome home, good and faithful servant. I want to greet you in the kingdom of heaven on the final day of judgment and wrap my arms around you and say, gosh, it's good to meet another redeemed sinner. That's what I want. But as long as you continue down the religion of wokeness, 
as long as you deny the divinity of Christ, you are outside of the faith. You have, as the Apostle Paul would say, shipwrecked your faith. I am throwing to you a life raft, trying to get you back on board. I want you on the ship with me because I don't want you to drown. But you need to understand why these evangelicals are pissed off. And why? Do you have to understand how pissed off I have to be to go on a platform where I traditionally lambast the shit out of evangelicals and come to their defense? That's what you have inspired. A cold callous, sarcastic, frigid Lutheran to jump to the defense of the major body of Christianity that he can't stand or tolerate. You've put me in a position to defend them. Because as heterodox as they can be, they have never been as heretical as you. Repent, pastor. Repent. And to all my viewers, until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.